Statement from the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, on COVID-19. The First Minister will take questions after a statement. I would encourage all members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on the First Minister. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. Earlier today, the Cabinet concluded the weekly review of the levels of protection for each local authority area, and I'll shortly confirm the outcome of that review in detail. However, in summary, I can confirm that no local authority will move to level four this week. However, three local authorities that are currently in level two will move to level three from Friday. All other local authorities will remain in the same level as now. I had previously indicated that this week's review would be the last one before Christmas, with the next scheduled review taking place on Tuesday 5th January. However, in light of the rising or volatile case numbers being recorded in some parts of the country, I can confirm that Cabinet decided this morning as a precaution to review the levels again next week. I have also asked the Minister for Parliamentary Business to work with the Business Bureau to agree contingency arrangements so that if we require to increase the level of protection in any area over the recess period, we will be able to notify Parliament accordingly. I will now turn to the context of this week's review and then to the outcome of it. Uh, but first, I will give a brief summary of the latest statistics. The total number of positive cases reported yesterday was 845. That is 7.4% of all tests carried out and takes the total number of cases to 107,749. 996 people are currently in hospital, a decrease of 16 from yesterday. 45 people are in intensive care, a decrease of one from yesterday. And I'm sorry to say that in the past 24 hours, a further 24 deaths have been registered of patients who first tested positive for COVID over the previous 28 days. And the total number of deaths under that measurement is now 4,135. Uh, these figures remind us again of the grief and heartbreak that this virus is causing. And again, my condolences are with all those who have lost a loved one. Today's statistics behind which, of course, are real people, provide an important and indeed a difficult context for this week's review. In recent weeks, the levels of protection applied across the country have helped to reduce prevalence of the virus. I reported last Tuesday that in the space of three weeks, the number of cases had fallen from 142 per 100,000 of the population to 99. However, over the most recent week, we have seen a slight rise in case numbers from 99 per 100,000 to 110 per 100,000. Test positivity has also increased from 4.8% to 5.3%. So while we remain in a much better position than in late October, early November, and as of now in a better position than many other countries, the most recent data is a reminder that our position, like that of countries across the UK and Europe, remains extremely precarious. It's also appropriate for me to update Parliament today on what we know so far about the new variant of COVID that has been detected in the UK. I have now been advised that through genomic sequencing, nine cases of this new variant have been identified in Scotland. All of these uh, cases were in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. It is important to stress that there is no evidence at this stage to suggest that this new variant is likely to cause more serious illness in people. And while the initial analysis of it suggests that it might be more transmissible with a faster growth rate than existing variants, that is not yet certain. It may instead be the case that it has been identified in areas of the country where the virus is already spreading more rapidly. Further analysis is necessary to understand this new variant better, and that analysis is being conducted through Public Health England. In the meantime, we are considering whether any additional precautions are necessary in light of what we know so far, including whether there should be any change over the Christmas period because of this or indeed the wider context, and I will discuss all of this later this afternoon with the other UK governments in a Four Nations call that we requested uh, yesterday. I will, of course, keep Parliament fully updated on any changes. Presiding officer, all of, what, all of what I have just reported makes the context for this week's review particularly challenging and underlines the need for continued caution. 
Uh, before I confirm the outcome of the review, though, let me also inject a more positive note. The vaccination programme is now underway in Scotland. Last week, health and care staff started to receive the vaccine, and yesterday, of course, the first care home residents were vaccinated. I can confirm that we will publish the first of the new weekly progress reports on the vaccination programme tomorrow. Over the course of next year, we firmly believe that vaccines will allow us to return to a much greater level of normality. There is, as we have reflected previously, light at the end of this tunnel. However, as I said a few weeks ago, the road ahead of us may still have dips in it. And at times, that means the light will be hard to see. And the next few weeks may well be one of those dips in the road. Uh, but even if, is, if it is obscured at times, we must remember that the light is definitely there and that we will get through this. Presiding officer, turning now to today's decisions. These have, as always, been informed by input from the National Incident Management Team and our senior clinical advisors. As our strategic framework requires, we have assessed the level of restrictions against all four of the harms that COVID causes, the immediate health harm of the virus, the wider impact it has on our health service, the social harms caused by restrictions and the economic damage that the virus and our measures to suppress it cause to people's livelihoods. As part of that assessment process, we consider the data for each local authority very carefully. However, we also by necessity apply context and judgment to that data. Our decisions are not arrived at via a simple algorithm or on the basis of indicators alone. We require to take account of other factors, including whether cases are rising or falling in a given area, area and the wider risk of transmission that may arise from, for example, the festive period. And we then reach cautious and balanced judgments that, in our estimation, are most likely to minimise the overall harm of the virus. Given the overall context to our decisions this week that I have set out, care and caution continue to be essential. As a result, I can confirm that all 18 of the local authorities which are currently at level three uh, will remain at level three. While we are still seeing progress across much of the central belt as a result of the recent level four restrictions, there are some areas, for example, East Ayrshire, North Ayrshire and Fife, where cases have increased quite sharply in the last week. While the changes in these areas do not warrant a move to level four at this stage, we will be monitoring the situation very closely over the next few days. Let me turn now specifically to the situation in Lothian. Last week, I confirmed that the city of Edinburgh and Mid Lothian would both remain in level three. That decision was subject to considerable scrutiny, understandably so, given that the raw indicators suggested that these areas should be at level two. However, having observed an increase in cases in the days leading up to last week's decision and applying our wider judgment, we concluded that easing restrictions would not be sensible. Unfortunately, the continued rise in cases since then suggests that this was the right decision, though I understand how difficult it was and is indeed for the people and businesses most affected by it. But in the past week, case numbers in the city of Edinburgh have increased by more than 40%, from 70 to 100 uh, per 100,000 of the population, and numbers in Mid Lothian have risen even more sharply, from 88 to 147 per 100,000. Test positivity has also increased in both areas. Our judgment remains, therefore, that it would be deeply irresponsible to ease restrictions in either the city of Edinburgh or Mid Lothian at a time when cases are rising sharply. Instead, our focus and that of local partners must be on encouraging maximum compliance with these restrictions to assure ourselves in the period ahead that level three is capable of containing and reversing the increase. To complete consideration of Lothian, let me turn now to East Lothian. Case numbers there have increased by more than 50% in the past week, from 69 per 100,000 uh, to 126, and this is on top of increases in the past, uh, the, the two weeks previous to that. Unfortunately, therefore, and with obvious regret, the Cabinet has decided that East Lothian will move back to level three from Friday. This is a difficult but essential decision to seek to avoid a further deterioration in the situation and keep people across Lothian as safe as is possible. I can confirm that Aberdeen City and Aberdeen Shire will also move from level two to level three from Friday. We have been monitoring the situation in both these areas as I have reported to Parliament uh, very closely and have concluded that tougher restrictions do now need to be applied. 
In the last week alone, case numbers in Aberdeen City have increased by more than 50% from 76 cases per 100,000 to 122. Case positivity has also increased from 3.9% to 6.1%. The increase in Aberdeenshire has not been quite as sharp as in the city, but cases there are still rising. It is therefore our judgment that level three restrictions are necessary to bring the situation in both Aberdeen City and Aberdeenshire back under control. I know that the move to level three for East Lothian, Aberdeen City and Aberdeenshire and the continuation of level three in many other areas involves real and continued difficulties for many people and for many businesses as well, particularly in the hospitality sector. However, these measures are, in our view, essential to get and keep the virus under control. It is also worth pointing out that we are not alone in Scotland in facing these challenges just now. In large parts of England, hospitality is closed completely and the whole of Wales is now under restrictions similar to our level three. Further afield, many countries across Europe are reimposing lockdowns as the winter months start to take their toll. However, I know that brings no comfort to those directly affected, so it is essential that government continues to do all we can to provide support. In addition uh, to existing packages of support, the Finance Secretary let, set out last week a further package of business support which is intended to provide extra help over the winter, and I would encourage all eligible businesses to make full use of it. Presiding officer, the other councils currently in level two will remain there this week. Those are Angus, Argyll and Butte, Falkirk and Inverclyde. I am pleased to report that the situation in Inverclyde has remained broadly stable. However, there have been recent increases in cases in Angus and Falkirk, and we will be monitoring both of these areas carefully over the next week. And I cannot rule out a return to level three for one or both of them. Finally, let me say a word about Argyll and Butte. Uh, last week, we reported a very sharp rise in cases there, but concluded that this was down to a particularly large outbreak in one workplace rather than wider community transmission. That conclusion seems to have been validated this week as case numbers have fallen again by more than 70%. This is in line with what we expected and hoped for given the previous low rates across Argyll and Butte. However, while this is positive, the clinical advice is that we should allow a transmission cycle to fully elapse before moving the area to level one. This will allow us to make sure that there has been no wider transmission from that workplace outbreak. I can therefore confirm that Argyll and Butte will remain at level two this week, but assuming no adverse change to the situation, it is likely to move to level one next week. There is one change that we will make this week, though, in recognition of the geographic diversity of Argyll and Butte. We will apply the same household rules that currently apply in some other islands to the outer Argyll Islands. Uh, Islay, Dura, Collinsey and Orinsey, Colin Tyree, Mull, Iona and the neighbouring islands of Ulva, Erid and Gometra. Uh, that means that from Friday, people on these islands will be able to meet in houses uh, in groups of up to six from a maximum of two households. However, I would take this opportunity to remind people in the rest of the country that staying out of each other's homes while incredibly difficult is the most important and effective way of limiting spread of the virus. Finally, I can confirm that the Highlands, Murray, Orkney, Shetland, the Western Isles, Dumfries and Galloway and the borders will all remain at level one. Presiding officer, I can also confirm that over the next two weeks, we will also be using the experience of the level system to date to consider whether the specific restrictions in each level remain adequate or require amendment in any way. Broadly speaking, we think the levels approach has worked well, but we know the winter period will put it under greater pressure, uh, indeed is already putting it under greater pressure. And we also know, and indeed see this in some of the data I have reported today, that case numbers are rising in some areas, despite level three restrictions having been in place for some weeks. So the time is right to review this, and I will report the outcome of that review to Parliament after the Christmas recess. Signing officer, I'm aware that the outcome of today's review and of course the wider context of it uh, in Scotland, across the UK and Europe is a very difficult one. We have been reminded again in recent days that COVID still presents a very real risk, uh, not just for us, but for countries around the world. Over the weekend, we saw Germany and the Netherlands announce extended lockdowns. And of course, as I've mentioned already, it has been confirmed that from tomorrow, the whole of London will enter England's highest tier of protection, which includes full closure of hospitality. 
Vaccination undoubtedly holds out a genuine hope for a return to something closer to normality in the, I hope, not too distant future. But that point is not quite here yet. For the moment, all of us need to do everything we can to limit the opportunities we give the virus to spread. Most of us, of course, will now be thinking ahead to plans for Christmas. As I said earlier, there will be a Four Nations discussion later today to state, take stock of recent developments, and I think that is right and proper. But for now, I would urge the utmost caution. If you can avoid mixing with other households over Christmas, especially indoors, then please do so. But if you feel it essential uh, to do so, and we have tried to be pragmatic in recognising that some people will, then please reduce your unnecessary contacts as much as possible between now and then, and of course, follow all of the sensible uh, rules and mitigations. For all that the last 10 months have been really difficult, I know that for many of us, the next few weeks are likely to be the toughest part of this whole experience so far. Uh, for any of us, the thought of staying away from loved ones over the Christmas period is difficult to bear. But hopefully by this time next year, all of, us will be, all of this will be starting to fade into a bad memory and we will be looking forward to a much more normal Christmas. And so this year, there is no doubt that the best gift we can give to family and friends, if at all possible, is to keep our distance, meet outdoors if at all, and keep each other safe. And of course, for all of us, it remains essential that we stick to the current rules and guidelines. The vast majority of us, with some exceptions for island communities, should not meet in other people's houses. That is hard, but it remains necessary. If you have been dropping your guard on this recently, I ask you to please think again. If we meet outdoors or in public indoor places, we must stick to the limit of six people from a maximum of two households. Travel restrictions continue to be absolutely vital. No one who lives in a level three area should travel outside their local authority unless essential and people from other parts of the country should not go to level three areas unless essential. And finally, remember facts, the five rules that help keep us all safe in our day-to-day -day lives. Wear face coverings, avoid crowded places, clean hands and surfaces, keep two metres distance and self-isolate and get tested if you have symptoms. Sticking to these rules now remains the best way for all of us to protect each other. By doing so, we help keep ourselves safe, we help keep our loved ones safe, uh, we also help to protect the NHS and most importantly of all, uh, we help to save lives. Uh, this year has been unremittingly horrible for everyone, but it has nevertheless reminded us what matters most, health, family, community and love. So let's hold on to all of that and to a determination to keep each other as safe as possible as we prepare to celebrate this very difficult and very different Christmas. Thank you very much, First Minister. The First Minister will now take questions, starting with Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This year has been difficult for all of us, and despite what we all hope, the rates of transmission that the First Minister has outlined today make it clear that this virus is not about to let up over Christmas. There is no room for complacency, and while the guidance allows for greater contact between households, we should all do our bit to limit the spread of the virus by being suitably cautious over the festive period. This week, we've seen the encouraging sight of the first COVID vaccines reaching care home residents. We all want to see the delivery of this vaccine continue to go smoothly, so it reaches the most vulnerable people as quickly as possible. However, some questions do remain, and we hope to see more of the government's plans published before Christmas. Uh, today, can I ask the First Minister a specific question that friends and families of vulnerable care home residents will be keen to hear the answer to? Can the First Minister outline where a resident is not able to or doesn't have the capacity to consent to receiving the vaccine for whatever reason? What processes are in place to ensure that this can be delivered without undue delay? Secondly, the news of a new strain of this virus will be a cause of great concern for many people, just as we start to see a light at the end of the tunnel. Yesterday afternoon, the First Minister received a briefing from the Chief Medical Officer on this development. Although we're only just learning of this and we appreciate that researchers may not yet have all the necessary details, can the First Minister go beyond her statement today and update Parliament on what work is being done to assess the virulence of the strain, the likely rate of transmission and any difference this strain has in symptoms and severity? First Minister. Um, in relation to uh, both of those questions, uh, in 
In respect of the first question about the process uh, for cases where very vulnerable older people in care homes, and this may apply to vulnerable older people in other settings, cannot consent to the vaccine, the normal power of attorney and adult with incapacity arrangements would apply. It may be helpful if I ask clinical advisers to set that out in writing for MSPs and place that in spice so that everybody, if they are being contacted by constituents or constituents' families, have that information uh, readily to hand. What I would say, uh, hopefully, uh, by way of assurance, is that these are issues that have to be taken into account uh, every year with the flu vaccine and with other uh, vaccination programmes and indeed uh, other uh, health interventions. In relation to the new strain of uh, the, the virus, uh, I think it's important to say firstly that we have to take this seriously, but it's equally important to say that none of us should prematurely overreact to this. Uh, the briefing I had yesterday from the Chief Medical Officer, which has been supplemented uh, later yesterday and today, with the latest information we have from genomic sequencing work in Scotland is, as I set out in my statement, that there have thus far been nine cases of this new variant uh, identified in Scotland. Uh, those uh, date back, as far as I'm aware, right now to the, the latter part of November uh, and into December, but we are still awaiting information on the time series of those and whether there are any connections uh, between them and any other information uh, that uh, the researchers and scientists consider to be relevant. Uh, it is, I think, important to say uh, that none of what is currently uh, known about this yet is absolutely certain. Uh, the briefing I have had, and I think uh, this has been replicated in the information given by the UK government, is that there is nothing, and I think this is an important reassurance, there is nothing to suggest that this new variant results in more severe illness in people. There has been a suggestion uh, from initial analysis that the uh, variant of the virus may transmit more effectively and more quickly than existing variants. But again, it's important to say that that is not yet certain. It may be instead that this virus has been identified in parts of the country. In England, that would be London in the southeast, and here in Scotland, of course, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, where the virus is already spreading more rapidly, so it is giving the impression that this new variant is faster spreading. It will take further analysis to answer those questions more definitively. I'm not going to try from a non-clinical uh, perspective to set out exactly how that analysis is done, uh, but samples of uh, this new variant uh, are being further analysed. They have to be uh, cultured and, and then uh, analysed and compared with others. That work has been uh, taken forward through Public Health England. It is hoped that we will get more uh, information over uh, the coming days, and I would hope before Christmas. And when uh, we do, I will, of course, set that out to Parliament. Thank you very much. Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm sure that the First Minister will be aware of research published in The Lancet this morning. It showed the much higher and disproportionate incidence of COVID-19 admissions to critical care units of patients from more deprived areas of Scotland. It also found a significantly higher incidence of COVID-related deaths in those areas. It cited factors like, and I quote here, the financial necessity to continue working, the nature of employment, that public transport may pose a significant risk, and it pointed to poor housing and crowded accommodation, all synonymous with poverty, none a matter of choice. So how seriously is the government taking the unequal impact of COVID-19 on those in Scotland living in deepest poverty? We know that the rollout of the vaccination programme rightly reflects age and occupation. But in light of today's findings, will the First Minister give higher priority to people living in Scotland's areas of highest deprivation? And will she both make available and promote the vaccine accordingly? Yes, sir. I'll come on to uh, the specific questions about the vaccine in a moment, uh, because there are uh, well understood processes for deciding the prioritisation of any vaccination programme. Um, but on the broader issues, I am aware of uh, the research uh, published in The Lancet. This is not, these findings are not new. Uh, we have been aware uh, for most of the past 10 months that there is a disproportionate impact uh, of this virus on people living in deprived areas and also a disproportionate impact when it comes to uh, people becoming seriously ill and being hospitalised 
going into intensive care or, or perhaps dying. What has not been fully understood and is still, uh, we are still developing our understanding is what the reasons for that are. And this is true also of some of our BAE, BAME communities. Uh, and the developing understanding uh, suggests that that is uh, less to do uh, with clinical issues and more to do with societal uh, circumstances. So exactly the factors that Richard Leonard has alluded to, uh, housing conditions um, and the broader conditions in particular areas. Uh, there is a lot of work ongoing to continue to, to understand that. But right from the start of uh, the pandemic or almost from the start, we have tried to factor that into our responses. So much of the work we've done to provide uh, additional financial support has been uh, geared towards those living in poverty and conditions of deprivation. So in short, we take it extremely seriously as we do all aspects of uh, this virus and will continue to try to ensure that our response is tailored accordingly and, uh, and is flexible as our understanding of all of these factors continues to develop. Um, my answer to the vaccine is probably slightly uh, more complicated because we do not in government uh, decide unilaterally what the order of priority for vaccine is. We take uh, the recommendations from the Joint Committee on vaccination and immunisation. That's the case for all vaccination programmes and is the case for the, the COVID vaccination programme. Uh, they have uh, put forward an order of priority that is based on uh, greatest clinical risk and the order of priority uh, that they have put forward, uh, the, the first group uh, for all populations over the age of 50, by the time uh, they are vaccinated, it is estimated that that will cover more than 90% of preventable deaths. And one of the reasons for that, and again, I'm not going to go too deeply into uh, clinical territory here, because I am not uh, obviously a clinician, is that we, while we know uh, or appear to know that the vaccines uh, and certainly the one that has been authorised so far suppresses illness in people who are most clinically at risk, we don't yet understand its impact on transmission from one person to another. So that's another reason why we have to carefully follow the recommendations that are put forward by the experts. And of course, we will continue to promote uptake of the vaccine in these eligible groups, and we will continue to adapt our programme should the science scientific advice suggests that that is appropriate. Thank you. Patrick Harvey to be followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. When much of the country was put into level four, the First Minister told us that that was being done in order to reduce the rate of infection so that many people could hope to have something approaching a more normal Christmas. But instead of waiting to find out whether those measures were effective, uh, the, the, four nation, the governments of the four nations committed in advance to the Christmas relaxation, uh, a decision which the editors uh, of the Health Service Journal and British Medical Journal today have said was rash and will cost many lives. Now that we're seeing an increase again uh, in infections uh, fully a week and a half before Christmas and a week before the Christmas relaxation comes in, doesn't it look pretty clear that the editors of these health journals are right? And what position, when the First Minister joins that Four Nations call about the review of the Christmas relaxation, what position will the First Minister advocate in that discussion on behalf of the Scottish Government? First Minister. Um, the first thing, uh, well, a couple of things I would say, first of all, the level four restrictions have reduced prevalence of the virus. And uh, if we look across most of the areas that came out of level four last week, those are the areas where the, the declines in case numbers have been most significant. Obviously, uh, we, uh, as we ease restrictions, we give the virus more opportunities to spread. And that is uh, why, perhaps counterintuitively, we need to take greater care as restrictions ease, not uh, vice versa. Uh, secondly, I, you know, people have different views on what we should do over Christmas, and I don't think the decision was rash. I, I know from my point of view, I can't speak for others, it was not rash and that it was carefully considered, as I've said before, agonised over. These decisions are always uh, agonised over uh, because they are not straightforward and there is no easy answer or black and white, absolutely right and wrong. But on everything, it is really important against this virus that we uh, retain the ability and the willingness to be flexible. And that's hard for people who want certainty. It's a natural human instinct uh, to want as much certainty as possible. Uh, but that's a very hard thing to give people right now. I think it is right that uh, not just because of the rise in cases, and the rise in cases uh, is less severe in Scotland right now, although this may not continue to be the case, but right now it's less severe in Scotland than it is in England or parts 
parts of England and certainly less severe than it is in Wales. But nevertheless, we see signs again that show that the virus uh, has not gone away. Um, so I think because of that, but also because of the news yesterday about the new variant, which, as I said earlier, we should not overreact to um, or get ahead of ourselves on, but nevertheless consider whether it should lead us in the direction of any more precautions. Uh, that is another reason why I think the Four Nations call to consider what the options are um, are would, is sensible. We uh, requested the Four Nations call uh, yesterday in the wake of the news about the new variant, and I'm pleased it's taking place uh, later this afternoon. I'm not going into it with a fixed uh, view, uh, because I think it's important that we have that discussion across the four nations, given family patterns across the UK. But I do think uh, there is a case for us looking at whether we tighten uh, the uh, flexibilities that were given uh, any further, both in terms of duration um, and numbers of people uh, meeting. And I will uh, consider the views of the other nations. Uh, if we can come to a four nations uh, agreement, I think that would be preferable. If that is not possible, then of course we will consider within the Scottish Government what we think is appropriate. And of course I will update Parliament uh, as soon as there is anything to update Parliament on. Thank you. Willie Rennie, followed by Christine Graham. I mean, there is only 10 days until Christmas, so if the First Minister um, has got an idea about what she's going to propose this afternoon, it would be helpful um, to alert the public, many of whom will have long journeys planned uh, for Christmas. I can understand why she might not want to take a, a fixed position, but I would hope she would understand whether she's wanting to tighten um, or otherwise uh, the proposals uh, for Christmas. So some more indications on that would be helpful for people. Um, I think there are some alarming indications today, and we've seen outbreaks in care homes, but there is an absence of information about the other drivers and sources of the spread. And people, I think, need more detail about the current form of the threat. So what more can the First Minister tell us about what the incident management teams are telling her so that they can respond to the threat appropriately? First Minister. Um, first of all, I say to Willie Rennie, I, I'll give him an assurance that I am acutely aware of how close Christmas uh, is right now. And I think he is right, and I am uh, very conscious of this, that notwithstanding what I said earlier about the difficulty, uh, and I don't like this any more than anybody does, of giving people certainty in the middle of a pandemic, uh, I nevertheless am acutely aware of giving people as much certainty as no and notice as we possibly can. That said, I think it is right to discuss with the other governments and see what uh, consensus uh, we might be able to arrive at. But I will update Parliament and the public, uh, which is uh, perhaps even more important, with no disrespect to colleagues in Parliament, uh, as soon as possible. But can I make one thing very, very clear, just so that it is not lost right from the moment uh, we decided for pragmatic reasons to recognise that some people would uh, choose to see loved ones over Christmas and then and therefore try to put some boundaries around that. But right from that moment, uh, I and the Scottish Government have advised people uh, not uh, to mix with others, particularly indoors over Christmas, if they can possibly avoid it. And that continues to be the advice I would uh, give to people. If you can get through this Christmas without seeing loved ones, if you have to see them, uh, try to see them outdoors, but you know we, we need to make sure that we are not giving the virus uh, chances to spread. Which takes me on to the second part of Willie Rennie's question. Sometimes, you know, and I am uh, as as guilty of this as anybody. I've gone through much of the last ten months. Uh, you know, urging my clinical advisers to give me as much complicated, in-depth information about the science behind all of this as possible. Uh, and that's understandable for all of us. But actually, there are moments where you have to accept that, at heart, this is not complicated. This is an infectious virus. And what uh, the scientists will tell you is that it spreads when people come together and give it the opportunity to spread. Uh, and that will happen in pubs and restaurants. It will happen... Uh, in people's own homes. It will happen if we allow it to in care homes, uh, in hospitals, uh, and it will happen uh, in all sorts of settings. So what we need to do is cut out uh, those unnecessary, and unnecessary is perhaps not the best word to use because most of us think just coming together with loved ones is a necessary part of life. But, you know, we have to go to work sometimes right now. Uh, we want children to be in school, so we have to try and cut out all of the other interactions that we don't have to have in order to stop the virus spreading. That is, you know, 
impossibly tough for people. I know it is. But for the remainder of this winter, it is necessary in order to get through and get further into the vaccination programme uh, with as little impact uh, of this virus as possible. Thank you. Christine Graham to be followed by Jimmy Green. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, while disappointed for my constituents in Midlothian that remain at level three for understandable reasons given the spike, Borders thankfully retains its level one status. Does the First Minister therefore consider the remarks by Colin Smith on behalf of Labour last week opposing the travel ban regulations, especially across the border, referring to Cumbria as low level when actually it's at tier two, which is high risk? was, to put it gently, misleading, and the ban is absolutely the right thing to do to reduce import of the virus to my constituents and beyond. First Minister. Um, I understand this is a really difficult situation for everybody, and I understand that members across the chamber are reflecting the frustrations uh, of their constituents when they raise issues in the chamber. So I, I, I understand that. But, but I do think Christine Graham makes important points. Can I point out that in relation to the borders, while borders is uh, remaining in level one, and I hope that will continue to be the case, there has been an increase in cases on the borders over the past few days, and therefore I would urge people across the Scottish borders to make sure they are complying uh, with all of the mitigations in order to make sure that that increase in cases uh, does not continue. Uh, but, you know, last week, yes, we heard objections again to travel restrictions. Travel restrictions are there for a reason, um, and the borders is a very good illustration of it where it has been uh, had had around it areas of higher prevalence and therefore if we want to keep the borders in level one it is really really important that we don't have people from other areas where the virus is spreading uh, more rapidly coming into the borders and imperiling that position uh, similarly last week we heard and I, again I understand it, it is legitimate but we heard uh, you know real opposition to the decision on the city of Edinburgh and Midlothian. But again, I hope what has happened in the week since will, even if it doesn't make everybody agree with every decision we're taking, will make those who were objecting to the Edinburgh decision last week at least reflect and accept that we are not taking these decisions lightly. We are taking these decisions because we think uh, they are necessary. That applies to the levels application and Christine Graham is absolutely right to say that it applies to the absolutely essential travel restrictions that remain in place. Jamie Green to be followed by Annabel Ewing. Thank you. Uh, over 2 million people are eligible for a flu vaccine in Scotland, uh, pre-qualified for that vaccine through a mix of age or underlying health conditions, many of whom have been isolated from society for the best part of nine months, voluntarily or otherwise, but not all of whom are on the official COVID shielding list. So can I ask for an update as to when this wider group of high-risk people are most likely to receive their COVID vaccine so we can manage their expectations and offer them some much needed light at the end of the tunnel. First person. Uh, there is, of course, the, the clinically vulnerable list as well as the, the other uh, shielding list. So people in these categories uh, are covered in one way or another. But the, the, the more fundamental point here I would make, and it is it's a really important point, that it is not me or the health secretary or any other minister who decides uh, who is on uh, clinically vulnerable uh, lists for clinical reasons. These are decisions that are recommended by clinicians because they are the ones uh, that understand the reasons. So we will always keep these things under review, but fundamentally we will continue to act on the basis of the best clinical advice that we have. Thank you. Annabel Ewing to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of recent COVID outbreaks in some care homes in Fife, where very sadly we have seen deaths of some residents during the period of the outbreak. The First Minister will also be aware of an increase in the number of schools linked to positive outbreaks in Fife. Can the First Minister clarify whether these developments have played a, a part in Fife remaining in level three? And can the First Minister take this opportunity to reiterate the importance of maintaining social distance, of wearing face coverings, and of avoiding crowded places so that we can hopefully stem the transmission of the virus and so that we can hopefully see Fife not going up to level four next week or thereafter? Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, well, firstly, I want to uh, simply uh, 
reflect the outbreaks that we have seen in care homes in Fife and uh, understand what a worrying time this is for families of residents of care homes, both in Fife and in other parts of the country. Of course, we continue to monitor uh, that situation with partners and local care home oversight groups very carefully. Indeed, we monitor these situations on a, a daily basis. Uh, decisions around the allocation of levels in Fife, as in other areas, are, are taken after a detailed review of all of the public health data, including local and national assessments uh, and consideration of the four harms. So this includes, as part of the assessment, the local incident management team reporting and also analysis of any local outbreaks, such as uh, the examples that Annabelle Ewing has mentioned in Fife. So yes, all of that is taken into account in reaching uh, the decisions we reach. And these outbreaks, uh, while they may not be the only reasons behind the decision to keep uh, an area in a particular level or put an area in a particular level, are part of coming to that decision. Um, as Annabelle Ewing rightly says, uh, we all have a responsibility to help suppress the spread of the virus and people in Fife as across the rest of the country should continue to adhere to the facts guidance as well of course as following all of the other rules that are in place in their areas and I would remind people that if you are in doubt about the rules that apply in your local area the postcode checker on the Scottish Government website has that information. Jackie Bailey to be followed by Julian Martin. People in Western Bartonshire have worked hard to follow the rules and we had hoped to be moving into Tier 2, but I understand the First Minister's cautious approach. That said, can she explain to my constituents why, when Western Bartonshire and Scottish borders have the same indicators, medium for cases, medium for test positivity, very low for forecast areas, low for hospital and ICU forecast, and the rise in numbers is 112% higher in Scottish borders compared to 7% in Western Bartonshire. Why Western Bartonshire is in Tier 3, but Scottish borders are in Tier 1? What additional factors have been taken into account in this case? First Minister. Firstly, can I just again um, completely reject this narrative of some people working hard and some people not working hard? Everybody in every single part of the country right now is working really hard to try to suppress the virus. Um, and, you know, sometimes with the best will in the world, we see the virus uh, increasing in some parts, which is why greater restrictions are necessary. But I think we have to recognise that everybody is making really hard sacrifices uh, right now. Um, I do think, uh, while it's uh, an important question, I think if Jackie Bailey uh, is listening, as I'm sure she is, to all of the information I'm sharing with the Chamber on a weekly basis, she would probably know the answer. I'm, I'm guessing she does know the answer to, to the question, actually. Western Bartonshire and the Scottish borders over recent weeks have been in very different positions because they might look as if they are converging on data alone right now, does not take away the, the different trajectories and experiences that these areas have had, which are factors in the pace of change that we now think is sensible. So Western Bartonshire has been in level four because only a matter of weeks ago, it had extremely high uh, levels of prevalence. And therefore we think it is prudent uh, and correct to take a bit of time before moving it any further down, which of course involves easing up more restrictions, because the danger is we could then quickly send it into reverse. Scottish borders have come from a different place, have had relatively low levels of prevalence, has been going up a bit in recent times, which is why we will be watching it carefully, but they are coming from different positions. And that, it's that wider context and that wider judgment that we need to continue to apply to try to get these decisions right. I fully accept and I think it's important that these decisions are subject to real scrutiny but I would ask people particularly those who again understandably really criticised the decision on Edinburgh last week to just reflect on the data then and at least accept that that wider judgment is important in arriving at the decisions that we have to arrive at. Gillian Martin be followed by Liz Smith. Thank you, President Officer. The review documents point to high levels of community transmission in Aberdeenshire, and we have also had workplace, uh, workplace outbreaks. A couple of weeks ago, the First Minister told me in the Chamber that uh, more deep analysis has been done on the nature of infection rates in Aberdeenshire. Can she give more detail on the types of community transmission that have increased the infection spread, and other than the increased restrictions that come with Tier 3, are there any targeted actions been taken, particularly in relation to work uh, workplace outbreaks and would it be advised that travel between Aberdeen City and Shire only be when necessary and that this might not include Christmas shopping which maybe should be done locally? First person. 
Um, in terms of Aberdeenshire, you know, I've said, I think, uh, for the, the past two weeks that we were concerned about the situation there and in uh, the city of Aberdeen and we're monitoring it carefully. Uh, there have been particular outbreaks in Aberdeenshire in care homes, uh, but also in particular workplaces that have had an impact on the overall picture. Uh, in terms of targeted actions there, uh, the work of Test and Protect is the most important in order to ensure that, uh, as far as possible, outbreaks in particular settings are contained, and I think Test and Protect is working well to do that. But it has also become obvious that there has been a wider background community transmission in Aberdeen and in Aberdeenshire, which mean that we cannot be confident that Level 2 restrictions are sufficient uh, to get that under control. So the Level 3 restrictions, uh, we hope, will have that effect over the next uh, few weeks. Um, and travel restrictions are an important part of that. Gillian Martin is absolutely right. And my uh, plea to people, it is the law, uh, that people should not travel except for essential reasons uh, from uh, one level three area to another. If you're in a level three, you should not travel outside your own local authority area. That does apply to Christmas shopping. Uh, you should shop locally, uh, wherever you can uh, right now, in order to stop the virus spreading, but also, of course, to help as much as possible your local businesses. Liz Smith, before we lose Ruth McGuire. Uh, thank you. The First Minister mentioned in her statement the difficulties that are faced by the hospitality sector. And I wonder if she could confirm whether the, uh, or at least some of the 60 million COVID spend, which was recently e-marked for tourism, will include assistance for golf tour operators who play such an essential role in the Scottish hospitality industry, especially in areas like St Andrews and Glen Eagles. First Minister. Um, I will come back to Liz Smith and confirm that because it is a, a particularly detailed point. I, I certainly recognise the point and if, it, if the particular fund she talks about doesn't, then I give an undertaking that we'll look uh, at whether there is further help we can make available there because uh, golf tour operators are an important part of our tourism industry. The, the impact of this on hospitality and tourism uh, is severe um, and that is true across Scotland. It is also true in other parts of the UK and I really do recognise that and uh, know just how devastating this is for people who run businesses, have built businesses or who work in these sectors. And the undertaking I will continue to give is that we will do everything within our power to provide the help and support that they need. Thank you. Ruth McGuire to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government's made of the test to release schemes such as the one being adopted in England and if there's any intention to adopt one here in Scotland? First uh, we are observing the proposed uh, pilot projects in England closely and, and will consider the results of those. I believe actually today is the first day of some of this happening in England. Some of the early reports I've seen today would suggest that there are uh, some significant issues uh, attached with it that perhaps need uh, further work to resolve and we will be looking carefully um, at that. Uh, we've also been in dialogue with uh, our own commercial airports around their proposals for test to release in relation to international travel and we will decide shortly whether uh, we are reassured enough that test to release can be implemented in a way that's sufficient minimises risk. All uh, along, our decisions on testing in quarantine uh, have been informed by clinical and scientific advice uh, to minimise the risk to public health, and that will continue to be the case. Daniel Johnson to be followed by Angela Constance. Thank you, President. It was reported in the press yesterday that the advice provided to the Scottish Government by the Director of Public Health for NHS Lothian regarding City of Edinburgh prior to last week's decision was, and I, this is how the document is quoted in the press, DPH recommendation is for a move to level two. Now I recognise that these level decisions are judgments, that's right, and indeed I think that is important, especially in light of changing circumstances. But I do think transparency requires that we understand how decisions are arrived at, not just what those decisions are. The published rationale for the level decision last week comprised just three bullet points, this week's at just five, with no supporting opinion or advice beyond statistics. So can I ask the First Minister to publish advice from local directors of public health alongside Scottish Government level publications as we go forwards? And can I also ask that the Scottish Government provide more published detail regarding the rationale and judgment for these level decisions, in particular when it differs to that of local directors of public health? First Minister. Um, we'll consider what more information we can publish. We are trying to publish as much as is possible, taking account of the fact that some of this is not down to hard data. Um, some of this has to be down to judgment. In fact, uh, that position uh, was challenged in court uh, last week. And of course, the opinion of the 
uh, the court uh, recognised the importance of that wider contextual process that the Scottish Government uh, is going through. Um, last week, uh, and you know, I was questioned in this Parliament, I think a week ago today, but if not a week ago today, then certainly First Minister's questions on Thursday about the public health advice in relation to Edinburgh. So the idea that that wasn't known, um, I don't think bears uh, much uh, scrutiny. But I believe that to have uh, eased restrictions in Edinburgh last week uh, would have been fundamentally uh, the wrong thing to do. It would have been a grave error uh, of judgment. Um, and while I accept that that might have been hard for those uh, who uh, are not taking these decisions to appreciate last week, simply looking at the raw indicators, I cannot accept that anybody, particularly anybody representing the City of Edinburgh, can look at the data this week and come to any different conclusion than it would be a, a, a grievous error of judgment to ease restrictions in the City of Edinburgh at this time. Angela Constance, to be followed by Edward Mount. Thank you, President Officer. First Minister, out-of-school care networks have benefited from the full range of job retention, business enterprise and third sector support funds. But they are now having to close projects in my constituency because of the fall in demand due to home working. Therefore, what further support will be provided to get these services for children and their working parents over this last hurdle to ensure that this essential infrastructure for our economic recovery is not lost forever. First question. Well, we recognise the changes in demand for childcare relating to uh, parents' work patterns and, of course, the loss of employment have had an effect on childcare providers, and that does raise concern about the sustainability of their essential services. We're working with the whole childcare sector to understand these challenges and to establish whether there are reasons why the financial support needs for out-of-school care differ to those of the rest of the childcare sector. In addition to the economy-wide support from both the Scottish and UK governments uh, that out-of-school care providers will have been able to access, the Scottish Government has also provided targeted support to childcare providers, which includes out-of-school care providers through the £11.2 million transitional support fund. But we will can continue to consider these issues carefully um, and look to adapt the support that is, is available if we can think that is appropriate. And Edward Mount. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, on the 1st of December, I asked you to reconsider allowing up to six people from two households within Level 1 areas to meet within their homes. Today, you've eased it for some islands, but not on the mainland. I've written to you twice, asking for Murray and Highlands to be included, and the leader of the Highland Council has publicly backed my call. First Minister, given that the Highlands and Murray remain with very low cases, and rightly within Level 1, when do you see the no household visits rule being relaxed? First Minister. Uh, we'll review that on a weekly basis. I appreciate the views of uh, local members and uh, members of the local councils. Uh, but the clinical advice at the moment is that outside of the island uh, communities, and these are islands uh, often that are uh, a greater distance away and don't have links to the mainland, it would not be um, a safe thing to do right now. But we will continue to review that on an ongoing basis. I understand how difficult that is. I think it's difficult for every one of us not to be able to visit other people's houses. But I know that is uh, even more difficult for people who live in uh, rural and remote communities where there may not be uh, other more public facilities where they can uh, meet other people. Um, so it is an issue we take very seriously. But I, I come back to a point that I made in response, I think, to Willie Rennie. This virus spreads by people coming together and interacting in the ways we all like interacting. And in order to stop that spread and to minimise the risks over the winter period, we have to be very, very careful about all of those interactions, which is why we think very carefully and uh, will continue to do so about these decisions. Thank you very much. And I'm afraid we have to call a halt there. Point of order, Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. Uh, last week, the Health Secretary assured me that islanders would have equal access to the Pfizer vaccine uh, as those in the rest of the country. Uh, it now appears that's not the case uh, for those living in smaller islands in, in Orkney and Shetland as a result of transport difficulties. There was nothing in the First Minister's statement in relation uh, to this, but I wonder uh, whether she might have the opportunity at some point to update Parliament on how islanders in my constituency and in Shetland might have equal access to the government's uh, ongoing vaccination programme. Thanks very much, Mr. Carter. I'm sorry I couldn't reach his question today. Uh, 
there will be other opportunities for Mr MacArthur to put that point to the government, either using a written question, uh, possibly uh, pressing at FMQs or other portfolio questions this week. Oh, point of order, Mr Findlay. Neil Findlay. Uh, officer, last week at topical questions, the Cabinet Secretary for Health advised me that urgent all-party talks would be convened to discuss care home visiting. I wonder if she has intimated to yourself whether she wants to correct the record since nothing has happened since last week. Thank you, uh, Mr Finlay. Uh, that has not been intimated to me. Um, the point that Mr Finlay makes is a point for him to raise and pursue with the Cabinet Secretary. I'm sure he'd be able to do so either by putting down a written question, perhaps writing or emailing the Minister, or taking other opportunities that Parliament offers to put questions to the Minister. Thank you. On that note, we will move on to the next item of business. There will be a short pause while um, some members change seats. I just encourage all members to wear their masks, observe social distancing and follow the one-way systems around the Parliament. Thank you.